There's a lot of people who are very worried about what's happening with Russia, one way or another. I've said this many times. I'm somewhere in the middle of this issue. I think that there is a xenophobia and fear-mongering about Russia, which I vehemently oppose. I, on a policy level, certainly want as much of a de-escalation as possible in terms of a bilateral relationship between the United States and Russia, and to the extent to which there's a policy upshot, things like, I mean, and this sounds frankly just utopian, but the reality would be multilateral agreements on things like cybersecurity and setting new frameworks uh, that would really restrain all of these countries from just uh, you know, massively violating each other's cyber uh, economies and cyber politics on a daily basis. We do it, China does it, Russia does it. It's a part of global affairs uh, and it's uh, potentially a very big problem. And it also, uh, in, in you know, different cases, is also a symptom of uh, real abuse. Uh, and if we look at, you know, Edward Snowden's revelations with things like, you know, obviously NSA surveillance of, uh, you know, civilians and citizens in this country and outside of it, but also uh, uh, some of the hostility and aggressiveness towards even the Dilma Rousseff government, we could still f see fed into uh, the crisis, the lawfare coup in Brazil that we've been focusing on so much today. On the other hand, I think people uh, have a, some people have an, uh, an odd sort of, I don't know if it's a sympathy for Russia, but I think they sort of undersell Russia's own imperial games and own sort of co-generation of problems. And I see no need to sort of indulge that perspective. And I'm down with using some of the things around this issue to whack Trump. I think there's a third way there. Uh, I didn't agree with Ryan Cooper's piece entirely, and I didn't agree with Corey Robbins' response entirely and the sort of lingo of this left conversation. But why across the board, it, there could be an invasion of Iran. That is a war that is very real possibility. And that is an area where the overwhelming policy consensus of Washington mandarins has been aggressive, illegal, raw, uh, uh, complicit, by the way, across the board, from Rudy Giuliani to Howard Dean in supporting a group called the MEK, which is a literal terrorist cult. A death cult. A death cult that fought on with Saddam Hussein in the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s and is hated across every political board in Iran you can imagine. And major U.S. policymakers and think tankers and those types of people across the political spectrum have supported the MEK. It's disgusting. It's a moral calumny. And there is a zero appetite amongst any faction in Iranian politics on the grounds or otherwise for the MEK. So there isn't even a colonial vehicle, frankly, to take over Iran. And if you're interested in supporting organic uprisings in Iran, whether they be labor because of Iran's incredible economic inequality, whether they be women's activists, whether they be people uh, working for the rights of everything from Baha'is and women specifically to civil assembly and uh, uh, you know civil rights broadly, any U.S. official backing those protests will reinforce all of the talking points of the regime that any uprising is merely a CIA instrument. And here is Ari Fleischer, uh, when you're ready, because this clip really distills everything wrong right now. This is a guy who helped propagandize and sell the Bush administration's lies, which led to its catastrophic invasion of Iraq, which is responsible conservatively for several hundred thousand deaths. And quite likely could be over a million, not to mention millions of displaced and a crisis that continues to this day. Here he is propagandizing now on behalf of uh, aggressive moves towards Iran. The level of corruption wealth among Iranian Pardon. leaders shows that Iran is Sorry. run by... This clip begins with Mike Pompeo describing the United States. Oh, wait, no, he's talking about Iran. Corruption wealth among Iranian leaders shows that Iran is run by something that resembles the mafia more than a government. What did you make of that comparison? I welcomed it. 
It was Ronald Reagan-like. And you know what? Iran is going through turmoil in its streets and its cities right now and has been for months. And it's a leaderless rebellion that's ha taking place because there's such a dissatisfaction throughout the Iranian society with its government. And Mike Pompeo put his finger on one of the biggest problems, and it's corruption. The people want their basic needs. They want their food. They want their health care. They want their environment. And the Iranian government is so corrupt, it's making it much harder for people to live in that country. So fascinating change is underway inside Iran. No one can predict where they're going to go. But the more unstable we can help Iran to become, mm. the better it is to actually secure peace if we can get rid of that theological regime one day, or if the Iranian people can get rid of it themselves. So it's interesting. So he just delegitimized organic movements in Iran which is the exact instrument and desire of people inside the Iranian government that want no change, and then threatens and spoke on behalf of U.S. regime change activities, which could be, short of North Korea and military conflict, potentially the most catastrophic thing that could realistically happen in the world today. So I would suggest that people get a lot more focused on averting this and I mean that across the board from assembling yourselves against the Republican war machine and also, and this is not political point scoring. I don't care about that. But when there was a sanctions package, which was primarily presented as a Russia sanctions package, and this is a great example of where I stand. I don't care about micro-targeted sanctions against Russia, to be perfectly blunt with you. I'm totally agnostic on them. I don't know how I would vote against on them. But they were part of a package that also that, that put sanctions on Iran. And this was before Bush destroy, uh, Trump destroyed that deal. Every single member of the Democratic caucus voted for that sanctions package, except for Bernie Sanders. And you should let all of these people know, particularly presidential contenders, that just as they needed to move in the right direction on Medicare for all and a federal jobs guarantee and a postal banking option, and you thank them for it and you appreciate their work, there is no bullshit about Iran. If you want to frame it from a democratic perspective, how could you not be fighting to the hilt to protect President Obama's signature foreign policy accomplishment, the greatest diplomatic breakthrough of modern American diplomacy. And, no, and, and beyond that, you better tell them that I don't care what the Israel angle is. I don't care what kind of Gulf or Israel or Emirates connections you have or what you feel or just the lazy cliche or arms industry for that matter, or just a lazy cliche of demonizing Iran, if you give an inch on facilitating every anything from even worse tensions and, and, and instigation to, God forbid, invasion, you will take that note. That's a foreign policy uh, red line, period. And we need to get serious about that and spend a hell of a lot more energy on that because that truly could be a uh, catastrophic and fits with a obscene U.S. foreign policy that, of course, as Marison mentioned before, uh, you know, very important moments like the CIA engineered coup of uh, Mossadegh in 1953. So I just wanted to, to put that on the table. It's very, very important to get Iran in the center of the conversation now. I, I think that's I, I'm really glad that we're bringing this up. I think it's something that a lot of folks on the left really need to um, be focusing more on. I mean, you know, the, the sanctions regime in general in Iran has been absolutely devastating. Yes. And the folks that are really hurt, you know, oftentimes are, you know, working people um, in Iran. And, and the things that they are unavailable to folks there, I mean, from even, um, you know, parts for airplanes. I mean, we saw, you know, a crash earlier this year. And this is because, um, you know, there are things that are just unavailable to people because the it's United States... It's very unsafe. I just want to elaborate. Iran's plane industry is structurally unsound and unsafe to a very rare degree in the modern world because they have not been able to upgrade their fleets because of sanctions. Correct? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. And it's like the thing is, like, you know, sanctions, uh, I know there, I know a lot of liberals are big fans of them, but I find them to be incredibly violent. And oftentimes they really hurt uh, people who are already suffering. I mean, we're t you know looking at Iran. We're also looking at, you know, U.S. actions in, in Venezuela, too. And, you know, oftentimes these History sanctions regimes, Cuba. Like, yeah, of course, you know, yeah. and it's like, you know, people talk about it's like, oh, this is a nonviolent way of enacting pressure. 
culture. We have to understand that the United States over the past, you know, 100 years, uh, you know, 50 years or so, has just completely dominated the global economy. And the amount of power it has as the world uh, reserve currency to be able to strangle um, entire nations um, from international trade and from even being able to have normal relations with other countries, it's incredibly damaging. And you don't create actual conditions, in my opinion, that are favorable to changing a regime that we might not particularly like. All that you do is you make people suffer, but you also in, instill a kind of um, you know, a grit against the U.S. who is so obviously engaging in a kind of financial war against you. I mean, like that's and it's so it's just so absolutely clear. And just one more point, you know, on the MEK, it's one of these incredible ironies of history. You know, the MEK gives so much money um, to these politicians yep. and to these figures. They they pay people fifteen twenty thousand dollars to come and speak at their rallies. All these folks don't even know what the MEK is in the first place. Right. And it's important that we become educated on these things. Look, you know, I, I mean, when I look at the you know the Islamic Republic in Iran, you know, it makes me very frustrated. It makes me sad. I know so many incredible Iranians. I know how much damage um, that the Islamic Republic has has done at the same time i also understand the conditions that the islamic republic was able to come into power and that was because not only let's remember this not only did the united states um destroy a democratically elected government in iran then it backed the shah for well decades. let's not but let's yeah. not forget the material reasons why and the british who were worried about losing the Iranian oil fields. Mossadegh was going to nationalize He was going to nationalize them. Was and they, the and there's a really yeah. great piece on the um, LRB. I'll tweet it out later. I can't remember the title right now. Um, about how British intelligence was basically able to uh, influence the United States' red you know, fears of communist revolution to just get the entire um, security apparatus in the United States into an uproar, feeling that they needed to take down a fairly moderate you know, social democratic politician um, oh, in definitely. Iran. And well, you know, Mossadegh was a was a was very much in the very analogous actually to Allende. Yeah. Um, and also, I would just say that the the rhetoric that sanctions are nonviolent reflects the broader delusion that economics is not a form of violence. You know, depriving people of foods, jobs, uh, uh, you know, uh, flying securely that's violence. Violence is not just the literalized you know, act of violence. All of this is violence. Uh, it's violence to cut food stamps. It's violence to take away people's health care. This is all violence. And when we understand that properly, the proper analysis and the proper economics, then you can't throw those terms around uh, so lightly.